can be projected to be solvent for 75 years, which is what I think the administration would like to, to see and many experts would like to see. Uh, I think some adjustments could be made. That doesn't mean you have to change benefits. It doesn't mean you have to reduce benefits. A tweet from Dingo Star who asks, Senator Bingaman, does U.S. energy policy advocate the import of low-cost Chinese solar and wind energy systems? Well, I think energy, U.S. energy policy doesn't really get into the question of, uh, of where the, the technology that we're using to produce and, and use energy is coming from. But I, I think myself, as a, as a matter of national economic policy, we ought to uh, try to promote and give preference to U.S. manufacturing of these products, and uh, there's a very serious uh, threat that we've got, especially as, as we're talking more and more about how we need to cut back on this and cut back on that. Um, there's a real threat that uh, the Chinese are investing so much in this area of developing clean energy technologies, whether it's wind turbines, uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, that uh, that uh, as we as we begin to use those technologies, we'll find that the only ones available are the, are the foreign manufactured products. Senator Bingaman was first elected to the Senate in 1982. In addition to his chairmanship of energy and natural resources, he sits on the Finance Committee, uh, the Health Committee, which <coughs> is uh, jobs related, and Joint Economic Committee. He's also a Deputy Democratic Whip and a member of the Leadership's Steering Committee. Uh, what's your major goal for this year? As a senator. Well, since I do chair the Energy Committee, I would say a major goal would be to try to get an energy bill reported out of our committee, uh, uh, either a, a large a comprehensive energy bill that deals with the various energy challenges we have or a series of bills uh, that deal with those challenges, and then uh, try to get that passed through the Senate floor. I think that would be an accomplishment. Obviously, we also have to do it in a way that uh, we can persuade the House that this is something they should agree to and, and let us send it to the President for signature. This weekend we're going to begin uh, uh, several months of recognitions of R Ronald Reagan's uh, centenary, 100th uh, anniversary of his birth. And uh, there, by the way, we're going to be doing much of our Washington Journal talking about the Reagan legacy this Sunday and covering some of the events. And USA Today has a list of them all across the country. I'm wondering, since you were here in this town and had a chance to uh, be on the legislative side of some of the battles over the Reagan policy, what do you think the Reagan legacy is? especially as regard to the whole budget debate that he brought to Washington? Well, uh, I'm sure I'm out of sync with some of your viewers on this. I, I, I remember uh, when I arrived in Washington in, in January of 83, we were beginning to run significant deficits at that time. And, uh, and I think the... Uh, the remainder of uh, President Reagan's term con continued us on that path. I, I think, uh, uh, the, of course, it was a very much anti-government drumbeat at the at the time. That was uh, that was the message that the government was the problem. It was not the solution. Is that a different message than the Tea Party debate this year? Or no, I think it's much the same message. I think it's the same message. It's sort of a, uh, a reemergence of that message, but. Um, we had the circumstance in the 80s, as I remember at any rate, where at the same time that uh, the government was being denounced, uh, deficits were going up and uh, spending was going up. And uh, uh, so, so I think we did not come out of that, that period uh, in good fiscal shape. And unfortunately, well, we got we got it, the country into good fiscal shape uh, during the Clinton presidency, but uh, we are now very much uh, back in the soup, uh, in in the sense of uh, we have enormous deficits now, and we uh, have to come to grips with it. Uh, a viewer uh, who uh, doesn't have a rosy view of the Reagan legacy regarding energy writes, Reagan ripped out solar panels. The USA was 28% dependent on foreign oil. Now we are 80% dependent and still here, drill, baby, drill. Well, I, uh, the, the general sentiment that uh, during the Reagan period there was uh, not <coughs> a very enlightened energy policy I would agree with. 
<clears throat> but I don't think those numbers are exactly right. The hearing we had yesterday, we asked that exact question as to what is the uh, dependence, uh, what percent of our oil comes from overseas uh, today, and, uh, and it was, uh, I think, in the mid-50s, 50%. 50 uh, so uh, I think 55 in that, in that range. Uh, another interesting point that came out in that hearing yesterday was that the high water mark as far as percentage of our oil that comes from overseas uh, was reached in 2005 according to these experts and we are now in a period where that's declining and we hope that it will keep uh, declining. One of the, uh, the <coughs> debates I heard with some of the witnesses was uh, that, that it's a global marketplace for all other things. And, uh, for example, we bring in sweaters from China and the like. And these two witnesses made the point that we, uh, independence shouldn't necessarily be a goal, that it is, in fact, a global commodity. What's your own view about the independence question? Well, my own view is that, uh, you know, we don't need to have total independence, but uh, we do need to dramatically reduce our dependence on foreign oil and uh, for national security reasons. I, I do think that oil is, is not like sweaters in the sense that uh, oil does have a dramatic impact on the economy overall uh, and the price of oil goes up, uh, we're dependent upon foreign oil. Uh, there are disruptions in supply of oil. All of that can have a devastating effect on our economy, and uh, we've seen that many times, and, uh, and I, uh, I hope we don't see it again. Clinton, Missouri, for Senator Bingaman. Larry's an independent. You're on. Good morning. How are you this Good morning. morning? Good morning. Sir, I have two questions for you. One of them is, how can the Democratic people in the Congress and in vote in health care, which will, will destroy the United States. All the states will become, they're already all in trouble, and so you're going to give them some more. My second comment is we need to get cap and trade put to bed, taken out of our lives, and also you can't solve the problems by taxing the to be Jesus out of the American people. Now, if you can answer those two questions realistically, you tell me how you can consciously vote for a sick for a health care bill that is going to destroy every state in the United States, every state, not just one, but all, because what you are doing is putting back the money back to the states who are already in trouble by putting this egregious health care bill in our lap. I'm 72 years old. I've always paid for my health care, and I will continue to do so. But when you put strains on us the way you are now, you're asking for trouble. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Larry. Well, of course, I disagree with the caller on the issue of the health care bill. I, I think the health care bill is a major step forward for the country and for the American people. Uh, and uh, as far as the burden it puts on states, uh, uh, I don't see a, a major burden on states. Uh, certainly no, no burden here initially, uh, but even as it uh, becomes fully, um, uh, fully phased in, uh, in, in my state of New Mexico, I think the, uh, uh, the federal government is going to pick up any additional cost on, uh, on Medicaid, 100% uh, of that, and uh, for several years, and then that will be reduced to, I believe, 94% uh, by 1919 or by 2019. So, uh, so I don't think it's uh, it's uh, an undue hardship on the states, and I think that uh, uh, there's an awful lot of improvements in health care and improvements in our health care delivery system that will result from the health care bill. On cap and trade, uh, there's no discussion that I've heard here in the Congress about trying to pass cap and trade legislation. Uh, that was a subject that was tried in the last Congress. Uh, I don't know of any effort in the House of Representatives or in the Senate uh, to pass cap and trade uh, legislation. Salt Lake City, Utah. Cindy, Democrat Slime. 
Yes, here in um, Utah we have more natural gas than there is oil in the Middle East, but I don't see any rush uh, to create uh, pipelines for the natural gas. I mean, there's also Colorado, Wyoming, New York, and other states. And if you think that Egypt is an isolated incident, it's only the beginning. So there's going to be several disruptions to oil. Um, so there needs to be emergency funds to create these pipelines. And think of all the jobs there are. But until we get these pipelines, something needs to be done about the speculation on Wall Street that's driving the food prices up and the, the oil prices up. Uh, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, Jordan, Egypt, all began with the high prices of food. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, first, on, on the issue of natural gas, I agree we've got an enormous uh, uh, supply of natural gas in this country. One of the great uh, uh, things that we have going for us as far as energy resources. Uh, unfortunately, the price of natural gas is now very low. And that's not unfortunate for consumers, but it's unfortunate in terms of trying to build pipelines or, or encourage additional production of natural gas. I think producers of natural gas or folks who might be interested in building pipelines look at the price of natural gas and say this just doesn't make sense for us to do this at this point. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we need to find ways to use natural gas as a substitute for oil in uh, transportation. Uh, and I think uh, we're, we're trying to do that with, uh, with uh, truck fleets of various kinds. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's also a push to try to do uh, more use of natural gas, of course, for electricity generation, which I think uh, makes all the sense in the world, particularly economic sense for utilities these days. We're taking it over for about five minutes because we started late. 905, is that okay sure. with you? Roseville, Michigan is our next caller, and this is Ellen, who's a Republican. Ellen, you're on the air. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the uh, cap and trade. It, it doesn't need to get passed anymore because the EPA is going around making all the rules, which leads me to my other comment about the rolling blackouts in Texas. They are The EPA is coming in, shutting down energy power. Uh, hospitals don't have power, blah, 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 but yet they have the uh, energy to keep the Super Bowl going. And then my other question is, is what do you think or what will you tell us about the free trade zones where energy plants are being cut and shut down here, why China is able to come in here and start them up? China is starting power plants up two a week as we're being closed down two a week, five a week. Can you answer that, please? Well, I, I don't know of uh, us uh, shutting down power plants two a week. I'm just not aware of that. I do think EPA has regulations that they are developing, which uh, will re result in the retirement and shutting down of some of the uh, old power plants in this country that uh, have the worst uh, uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and other pollutants uh, that, that result from them. And uh, that's, uh, that's over a period of uh, quite a few years. Uh, but uh, I, I'm also not aware of anything, any action the EPA has taken that uh, is, is pointed to as a possible cause for the, the blackouts, uh, the rolling blackouts that she referred to in Texas. I think that has much more to do with the weather. Than, uh, than it does with EPA. Last call for you, Senators from Richmond, Virginia. Hank is a Democrat there. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Thanks Good. for your call. Good. I have a question that's been sort of bothering me. I worked for some years as an aircraft mechanic and inspector, and back somewhere in World War II, I think they came up with synthetic oil. All aircraft use synthetic oil, and I don't know why we don't use it in automobiles more. We do use it in some cars now, but I understand that it only takes uh, one filter to change the whole system over. So why don't we mandate that all cars manufactured in this country or shipped into this country must use synthetic oil? It would save us a tremendous amount of money, and there's no reason why we can't and shouldn't be using it. If aircraft use it, then all automobiles should be using it, and it would also help with the emissions. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I uh, can be totally responsive to the question. I think 
my understanding is sin fuels generally, uh, synthetic oils, synthetic fuels of various kinds, so uh, it's still very expensive to produce those. So we do not have an ample supply of any of that, and it, it probably is not economic to, to develop one. Um, I do think uh, we, we have had a push uh, to, to have, have all cars coming into the market, all cars and trucks coming into the market, be flex fuel vehicles, meaning that they could use either biofuels or, or regular gasoline. And uh, I think that's a very good thing to do, and that can be done relatively cheaply. Uh, and as we use more and more biofuels, so one of the reasons we've been able to reduce our imports of foreign oil somewhat has been uh, the increased use of biofuels in the transportation sector, which has been a good thing. Uh, we, as we close out here, a last question for you. This, this week, two developments in healthcare, and we had um, a couple of calls about it. One was the, the Senate vote, uh, which failed uh, uh, by uh, 57, I think, supporting it, failed to get to 60 on health care and, and uh, the amendment that was talked about by Senator Wicker. The other was the second federal judge that ruled uh, the health care plan unconstitutional. I'm wondering what you think the fate of the health care law is going to be with these both legislative and uh, legal court challenges to it. Well, legislatively, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, the votes are there in the Senate to do any kind of repeal of the health care bill. And, uh, and as I say, I, I support the health care legislation, so I, I uh, am glad to see that. As far as the courts are concerned, uh, there are challenges, and we've got two judges that have said it's uh, fine and two judges that have said uh, they, uh, it's unconstitutional, and some re one, one judge said in some respects it's unconstitutional, another said it's totally unconstitutional. Um, so it's headed it's, for the Supreme Court. It's, in all, other words. it's all going to the Supreme Court, and they will have the final word on it. Uh, but uh, the legal experts that we heard from when we were developing the legislation uh, uh, seemed fairly confident that it would survive any challenge, uh, such as those that are now being made against it. Senator Bingaman, we always appreciate you coming here and taking viewer calls. Thanks for doing Thank it you. today. The numbers came in uh, that we only added in, a, in the U.S. economy 36,000 uh, new jobs. Uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal lead is the economy adds few jobs, and, um, uh, and, and this is a, a difficult matter. Um, some say maybe the weather had something to do with it. Uh, the uh, Washington Post report noted that the job creations were far fewer than the economists had, predict, had predicted. 36,000 might sound pretty good, um, at least not bad, but in truth it's not good. The, Mr. Bernanke, the 
Chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, testified before our Budget Committee that um, Senator Bezos, our presiding officer, is a member of, uh, that the economy needs to uh, produce about 150,000 jobs a month, add that many, to stay even. And we really need to be adding, he said, about 250,000 a month to begin to reduce unemployment in a significant way. So the numbers are, are mixed. Some people saw some good numbers in them. The uh, survey showed uh, 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 a drop in uh, unemployment, which was not a bad report. Uh, but this hard number of actual jobs uh, was pretty troubling, I think. Uh, I would just say a few things that I believe are important and, and need to be understood. This Congress passed a stimulus package that was supposed to keep unemployment from going above 8 percent. It went to 9.6. Uh, it's dropped some since then, but it's still extraordinarily high. Uh, we passed that package, and it didn't stop unemployment from rising. It was based on a Keynesian concept of government taxing, really government borrowing money to spend into the economy on the theory that government can create jobs. Not long before the vote, uh, Gary Becker, the Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago, wrote an op-ed, and in it he said he'd examined the proposal and that it was far too uh, ineffective in creating jobs and economic growth. He warned that it would not be effective. He warned that the growth factor was uh, below one. It should be above one. He, he said maybe 0.7. Uh, and that this, this uh, in his opinion, was not a good investment of $900 billion, the largest expenditure in American history at a single time. Nothing has been like it. Every penny of it was borrowed. We didn't have that money. Uh, we decided to borrow the money in an attempt to stimulate the economy. Now, I know uh, many heard it said, uh, and the president repeated, that this was a new infrastructure problem, a program, that uh, we were going to uh, fix our crumbling infrastructure. We were going to create American jobs and make our highways and bridges safer and better. Well, that was not accurate. That was an inaccurate statement. It became clear before the bill passed, I remember uh, pointing it out, as did others, that only 4% of the $900 billion uh, went to uh, unemployment, uh, went to bridges and, and highways. 4%. Uh, this was not a bridge project. It was an aid uh, to social programs, state aid, uh, billions and billions of dollars. It created no real growth and productivity improvements in the United States economy. And so it hasn't done what we want. I hate, you know, just to be a, I told you so, but I say that because when you take $900 billion and you borrow the money, and if you're borrowing it at, what, current in interest rates are a little below 4%, but are projected to go up, and we have no plans to pay this money down, no mechanism uh, in, in place uh, to actually pay this debt down. It'll be on our books for the indefinite future, maybe forever. We'll pay about $36 billion a year in interest. Every year now, when we come to do our budget, we've got a, a, a figure. At first, we've got to pay $36 billion for uh, the... Uh, uh, interest on that money that we borrowed that was supposed to stimulate the economy that didn't stimulate the economy. And uh, $40 billion, at least a couple of years ago, was what the federal highway budget is. So in a, we, we passed a bill that will tax us through interest payments every year an amount equal to what we've been spending on highway, federal highway programs, just to give an example of how much money $36 billion is. So uh, it was, as Bill Gross, the guru behind the PIMCO 
bond fund, I guess the largest financial investment firm in the, country, in the world, um, he said the, the uh, emphasis uh, in America and some other nations has been on consumption, not effectively enough on growth, which is sort of what Mr. Uh, 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 Gary Becker, Professor Becker said, uh, and Sec uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Mr. Bernanke said now recently uh, repeated, there are going to be several years before we get to a normal job growth situation, a normal uh, unemployment rate in our country. Um, and even though the unemployment rate seems to have dropped, I, I think it is important to, to note that a, that a number of the people dropping off the unemployment rolls are dropping off because they've given up in looking for work. Uh, they, they've, they've gotten discouraged and they're not, no longer going down to the unemployment office and registering and looking for work, and that's not good. A healthy, vibrant, growing economy looks to be bringing more people into the workforce, uh, and that affects and ma can make the unemployment rate look better than it really is. Uh, there was an article in Barron's uh, financial magazine uh, recently that <clears throat> noted that as of December, the number of hours being worked by employees had not gone up. And they were saying, all these numbers, we've gotten optimistic a bit here, but we've got to be honest with ourselves. All the numbers aren't good. Uh, we make a little progress, and we're happy for that, but all the numbers aren't good. The number of hours uh, work were not up. And the comment is, normally, if unemployment in, goes down and businesses hire more workers, uh, they will show average hours worked going up, and it was in the low 30s, uh, which, and it wasn't going up. So they said, maybe that's a signal that some optimist, uh, uh, maybe too optimistic because of that. They also noted that wages were basically flat, just a minor increase in wages, whereas things like the price of gasoline, which we are so thankful Alaska is producing a lot for us, uh, prices for gasoline and food is going up, cotton prices, soybean prices, corn prices are at record levels. Now, this will translate into dry, a rising cost. So if your wages are flat and your employ number of people working uh, is flat uh, and your costs are rising, uh, then uh, this isn't good for the economy. It's really not growth, the kind of growth we want to see. So. If government can't borrow money and create real employment of a sustained nature, what should government do? Mr. Gross recently at a Barron's roundtable said that this pumping of money in as we're doing it today uh, has had some benefit, but it's a sugar high it won't last. You can't keep it up. Don't we all know that? Don't we all know that this is a uh, 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 blowing a balloon? Uh, this is a sugar high that we can't continue? Uh, what could we do? Are there things we can do? Is it hopeless? Should we do nothing? I don't think so. I think there are a number of things, and I would just mention them at this moment, that I absolutely believe that we could do that would create jobs for people who are hurting this very moment, who are unemployed, and it could really help them have a new and better life, and it would not cost the United States Treasury anything. And I believe these actions are significant. <clears throat> First, we need to take actions that have the uh, tendency and create mechanisms that will bring down energy cost. Energy is a hidden tax. A hidden tax, energy, rising energy cost, or a tax on our current income. You get nothing more for it. You, you uh, 
get the same number of gallons, the same assets you got before, we just have to pay it more of it. So you don't have money for your children, your family, your rent, your house payment, your automobile payment. You just get less of it. And we need to produce more of it at home for two reasons. One, it helps contain the growing cost of, of uh, fuel, which is a secret uh, thief of the American citizen's income. And second, it creates American jobs. Wouldn't we rather have uh, thousands of more jobs in Al Alabama uh, producing oil offshore or in Alaska producing oil in Alaska uh, than uh, sending our money to Venezuela, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, creating jobs there? It both be help. It would be a supply, additional supply source that helps bring down the cost, and it would create American jobs, and it would keep that American wealth at home. It would keep that wealth at home. 60% uh, uh, of the oil we are, we are putting in our, using to buy, make gasoline that goes in our automobiles is imported. That wealth is going abroad. It's not good. So we need to take actions that will produce American energy at the lowest possible cost. Yes, it needs to be safely produced. We saw the accident on the Gulf Coast. I've been on those beaches and thank goodness they're cleaned up now, but it was a mess and everybody was worried and it hammered our, our, our Gulf Coast tourism industry and our fishing industry for months, although it's, fishing is coming back now and I think our tourism will be back. But it was an un unnecessary disaster and it can be prevented and steps have already taken to ensure it doesn't happen again. We can do that. Um, <clears throat> I like the Boone Pickens plan. We've discovered how to drill down to the, into the ground and then turn that drill bit uh, horizontal and go through shale rock to p produce huge amounts of natural gas. Natural gas burns about 40% cleaner uh, than gasoline or diesel fuel. Uh, it produces, uh, it can produce energy. It even can be converted and can be used for vehicles. So it's all American. It's energy produced here in America. And we have to have Americans to drill the wells, to move the uh, natural gas, to process it, and do all the things that goes into that, instead of importing oil from uh, Venezuela. This makes sense. We can, this is not a theoretical vision for an energy program. Uh, the Energy Department has now projected that we have uh, maybe 200 years of uh, na natural gas, 100, uh, twice what we projected just a few years ago because of the new improved way to drill. And we should be doing more of that and it creates American jobs and would provide a new energy source that hasn't been there before, could create, uh, be used for electricity. Uh, natural gas prices are, are low, uh, pretty surprisingly low, actually, compared to other sources of energy, and we ought to use more of it. We can use it in vehicles, too, particularly larger trucks, city buses, uh, and uh, vehicles like that. Uh, but it would take an infrastructure um, capabilities to uh, uh, be able to uh, travel around the country and be able to get it for, the, for our truckers. But the city buses, the uh, uh, garbage trucks and things like that can be done all over America and that would reduce our imports, create jobs here, create wealth in America, not be sending it abroad. Um, we, now I know the president has said, and we're going to have to confront this and talk about it, he has said that we're going to create green jobs through solar and biofuels and that sort of thing. And there's been some hope for that, but really it hadn't gone nearly as well in the United States as we hoped. One big plant that had millions of dollars in Massachusetts uh, put into it has gone bankrupt. Uh, China is uh, undercutting prices and uh, producing prices, things that were supposed to be American jobs. It's not going so well, frankly. It's just not going so well. And I have to 
give this cautionary tale. No nation in the world committed more to green jobs and this idea that you could create jobs in the energy sector by uh, doing more windmills and solar and biofuels than Spain. And Spain has just had a terrible time. Spain had the highest unemployment rate in Europe. They drove up the price of their energy. It adversely impacted the whole economy of Spain. They created some jobs in some of these new programs, but one study said they lost, I think, two and a half jobs for every one created. Now, I wish this weren't so. I wish we could just have a plan to invest in solar panels or um, corn ethanol, and it would just create lots of jobs and create energy at a competitive cost, but it produces these energy sources at much higher cost. Someone has to pay for them, and businesses have to pay for them, and they can't hire as many people, and they can't make widgets in Alabama and sell them abroad if the energy price goes up 20, 30, 40, 50 percent as a result of these policies. You can't do it. There is no free lunch here. So I, I think we need to see what happened in, in Spain. I had a group of um, pulp and paper workers, union members, uh, yesterday. I, I knew a couple of them from the past. They had pulp and paper mills around where I grew up in the, in the country in Alabama. And they are worried that the Environmental Protection Agency regulations, this uh, 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 boiler MAC, among others, there are a lot of these regulations, but the one that's hammering uh, the timber industry, that's hammering uh, the pulp and paper industry is a boiler MAC. Uh, they, they convert waste wood product at these paper mills. They burn it and create steam and energy that reduces their demand on the uh, uh, grid and from the power companies that create it through uh, coal and natural gas. And so it's a renewable source, but they're requiring now millions of dollars into new boilers. And I was at a sawmill in Alabama in a rural area. Uh, good people, they export um, half of what they produce in, in this lumber. They have a real fine lumber uh, quality that they export. And uh, uh, they say this boiler mac can hammer them so hard that they may not be able to continue in business. And it, what, what would that do? All the people that go out in the woods and, and harvest uh, timber, uh, those who bring it in, those who work at the, uh, at the mill to saw it and plane it and, and produce it are damaged. Uh, you'd have less competition uh, within the United States for uh, wood products and less production of it, so price might go up. Uh, for the consumer. So this is not a good plan. This regulation went too far. It's got to be repealed. But there are a lot of them like that that are driving up costs. It could be eliminated at no cost to the government, reduce the number of bureaucrats that are out there enforcing it, and allow the, the industry to be more productive. There's lots of that out there. And a regulation that gets passed, sometimes that regulation might be beneficial to a narrow sector, but often it gets applied to 10 times, 100 times as many companies and businesses that, that, uh, than, than is necessary or beneficial, and they have an extra cost reducing their productivity for no good benefit whatsoever. All wasteful regulations need to be eliminated. The president is, is finally, I think, uh, understood that. He's made some statement about it, but we need to be sure that it happens, and it happens quick because we've got people unemployed today as a direct result of excessive regulation. A lot of people may not realize that our corporate taxes, once Japan reduces theirs, as they plan to do, will be the highest corporate tax of any developed nation in the world. 
This is not a healthy place to be. In the airport, you learn a lot in the airport. Um, a businessman started talking to me about this. We got on the plane. I had an open seat. I asked him to sit by me. Very impressive. CEO for a North American division of an international corporation. They were going to produce a product in that company uh, that would be sold in the United States and worldwide and that would be a f energy efficient a chemical product that they wanted to produce. It would be about 200 employees. This is a story he told me, and he was so frustrated about it. This is a very intelligent, sophisticated man. He said, they had the best price. These big companies, if you're going to make a new product, they ask every plant in their system who can build it the best, the cheapest. And the one that wins the competition gets the, the process. He had won the competition. 200 new jobs to the Alabama plant. Until he got a call from the European headquarters. They said, you haven't considered the taxes. Well, what about that? So, oh, we gotta, you've got to consider taxes. That's the cost of doing business. It's not, you know, you've got to refigure it and do the taxes. And the United States lost. It's going to be, this process is going to be built in another country that had lower taxes. The idea that you can raise taxes on corporations and not have an impact on the competitiveness of those corporations is utterly false, of course. We just have to take a minute or two to think about it. Of course that's damaging to our competitiveness, and we compete worldwide, not just between, uh, within the United States, but producers uh, can move to Mexico, they can move to Canada. By the way, our corporate tax rate is 34%. Canada is talking about, they've already reduced theirs to the low 20s. They're, they're talking about going to 16.5%. I, I know, I guess my colleague from Alaska, it, so a plant wants to choose between building a plant in Alaska and building one in Canada, building one in New York, or building one in Canada, and they add up the numbers, and you've got to pay substantially more tax in, in the United States. That could be the tipping point to make the difference in where that plant is built. So it's not that we're trying to help corporations by proposing that the uh, taxes be reduced. It's that we're becoming uncompetitive. You know, Ireland's been, had a financial crisis. Their banking system uh, reached a real crisis. But a number of years ago, they reduced their corporate tax rate to the lowest in Europe and had an economic boom. And this boom didn't have anything to do with the financial crisis. And when the Europeans said, we're going to have to bail out your banks, help you bail out your banks, and we want you to raise some revenue, they said, we'll do some taxes among our budget cuts, but we're not going to raise our corporate tax. They refused because they said, it was helping them economically. And I really believe we need to do that. So Canada is reducing theirs. Ireland is reducing theirs. Uh, the UK, the Brits are, are reducing theirs. I think they're going to about the mid-20s. Uh, we're at 34. And I know there's this idea that you can just eliminate the loopholes and bring down the overall rate uh, to the high 20s in the United States and that this will be the equivalent of a tax cut. But I really don't believe it is because I believe that uh, all you've done is maybe, maybe create a little more efficient and simpler tax, which is not bad, but it hadn't gotten the economic tax burden off American businesses who are trying to compete in the world marketplace. What else can we do to create jobs? Eliminate the health care bill. I know people are dug in on this. They don't want to talk about it. And uh, it was passed by one single vote. Had Scott Brown been elected two weeks sooner, uh, the bill wouldn't have passed. It wouldn't be law today. But it is law. What does the Congressional Budget Office say about its impact on jobs in America? CBO says that uh, 
it cost half of 1% uh, on our job creation, and that's 700,000 jobs. According to Mr. Douglas Oaks uh, Aiken, uh, who was former CBO chairman, uh, director, who wrote a paper about it. 700,000 jobs are going to be lost as a result of the health care bill. Actually, I believe it's quite a bit larger than that. That's the Congressional Budget Office numbers. I visited with small business people in Phoenix City, Alabama, and Jasper, Alabama, 15 or 20 in each, and they told me that it was going to cause them to reduce employment. The health care bill would. There's no doubt about it. One man said, I've got uh, uh, 10 fast food restaurants, uh, 200 employees. Uh, it will, I believe I'm heading to reduction of 70 workers. If it's a reduction of 10 workers, it's too many. If it's a reduction of five, we need growth in jobs, not reduction in jobs. The health care bill is killing jobs. The Congressional Budget Office director and is hired by the Congress. Uh, Mr. Uh, Elmendorf, who does that, is the, uh, was selected by the Democratic majority. I like him. I think he's an honest man. He said it will cost uh, jobs in America to continue the health care bill. I believe it's going to be far more significant than he suggests. One of the things I asked the witnesses at the Budget Committee hearing yesterday would these temporary extensions of tax rates, are they detrimental? Would the economy be better with permanent rates? And they said yes. Every, every one of them, liberal and conservative, said this uncertainty is not good for economic growth and job creation in America. Congress get together, and that's going to take a bipartisan effort to try to get the tax rates permanent, and all of us are going to have to work at it, but permanent tax rates would clearly be helpful. Um, I believe the President is going to have to help us in Congress uh, to reduce the surging deficit spending that uh, is on, well on the path to doubling the entire debt of America in five years and tripling it in ten. I know people think that's not true, but it is. The entire debt of America is, uh, we're in the third year, going into the third year uh, of uh, a five-year trend to double the debt, and it will triple again in five more years. Another president announced that he would freeze a small portion of our spending, discretionary spending, at his current 2010 levels, which were surged in the last two years, double-digit increases. It would freeze it at that level. That is very small and will not alter the path we're on to doubling the debt in five years and tripling it in ten. It will not alter, alter that. That's how small an impact that proposal would have. So we've got to get together here in Congress and wrestle with it, but we really need some leadership. And if we could get the cr cloud of debt and fear that's out there among a lot of Americans on the street, and a fear among a lot of the world's best financial minds who move money around in huge amounts. They're afraid, too. The only people that don't seem to be quite sufficiently uh, grasping this is uh, our Washington bureaucracy. I think the Congress is beginning to get it. I think Congress is thinking, but I believe the uh, Washington establishment still sort of in denial. They, they think we can just somehow make a few token changes in what we do and everything is going to be okay. It won't. So I'm just saying, how do we create jobs now? Take some real firm steps and the world says, wow, the United States has gone off an unsustainable path uh, to a path that could lead to prosperity and growth and we're willing to invest in that country again. Um, I ha I, let me mention one more thing. This has been a matter that's been talked about. But we have an, a border that's still wide open and lawless. Thousands, millions of people are coming in illegally still, and they're taking jobs from American citizens. 
We arrested uh, 500,000 uh, people at the border, 600,000 people at the border last year. How many more got by? We just added 36,000 jobs this month, and some think that was a good number. It's below what we have to add, but we had that many illegal uh, people coming into the country and, and uh, seeking work and taking jobs from American citizens, uh, providing competitive uh, uh, employment that drives down wages. We've got one of the things you do in a time of high unemployment, uh, you re reduce guest worker programs and you reduce illegal immigration. It's just an added incentive to do what ought to be done anyway. Um, so Mr. Bernanke testified before our budget committee a couple of weeks ago that we're treading water. We need 150,000 uh, jobs added every month to stay even and to change the dynamic of high unemployment, we take, we need at least 250 a month. And we've had that coming out of previous recessions, we're just not seeing it in this one. And I believe the 36,000 job creation, even if that number is somewhat low because of bad, bad weather, is not a good sign. It's below what the experts projected. And I believe we can say now with great confidence that the federal government's attempts to borrow money, which we pay interest on for as long as we live on this earth, uh, to pump into the economy as a short-term stimulus, a sugar high, is not effective. It's not working. We've got to do the kind of things I've just mentioned, and there are a lot more, that would actually create productivity, make our and corporations and businesses more competitive and then therefore allow them to compete against foreign competition, create growth, jobs, exports, reduce our exports of oil and gas that are help driving up uh, energy costs and uh, moving jobs out of the country, moving American wealth out of the country. If we do those kind of things, uh, we can make real progress. I really think we can. And we need help from the administration. I believe the American people are open to these kind of ideas. I think the idea that this is not a popular plan because, oh, you're talking about cutting taxes on corporations. It's, nobody wants to do that. They don't believe that. The American people won't support that. But I think the American people understand we can't tax our corporations more than they're doing in Canada. 34% to 16% and expect to win competition for jobs and business, we've got to make some of those uh, changes. Even if we have to raise taxes somewhere else, we've got to look at the taxes that are killing jobs and try to make our tax uh, policy further growth, prosperity, not austerity. Austerity is necessary now because of our profligate habits and the, and the situation we find ourselves in. But it's not the future. If we do the right thing, uh, this co co country can compete if we uh, take, take on good policies uh, in an effective way. Um, Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
General speeches on the floor of the U.S. Senate today as they wrap up their legislative week. They'll resume Monday, uh, consideration of the FAA reauthorization bill. Yesterday, the Senate passed a resolution that would pledge the Senate's full support for Egypt's transition to a representative democracy. Over on the um, over on the House side, the House is back next week, and Foreign Policy's or Josh Rogan reports that House Foreign Affairs Chairwoman Ileana ross and will bring two top national security officials to Capitol Hill next week to testify on the administration's policy concerning Egypt and its implications for the escalating crisis there. Earlier today, the Labor Department, Bureau of Labor Statistics, announced the um, unemployment rate had dropped to 9 percent in January, but they say that job growth remains slow, the economy adding only 36,000 jobs. This morning, Washington Journal focused on that topic with Stephen Rose at the Center on Education and the Workforce at Georgetown University, and we'll show you some of that conversation as the quorum call continues. And let me introduce to you our final guest. Stephen Rose is at uh, Georgetown University. He is a senior economist. Uh, for uh, their Center on Education and the Workforce, and we're pleased to have him back at the table this morning. I'm going to ask, I'm going to read the detail of the AP story by Christopher Rugeber on the unemployment rate because it's hard to interpret, <laughs> and I'm going to ask you if you can help us understand it. I'll do my best. Okay, here's what he, that they write. The unemployment rate dropped sharply last month to 9 percent, the lowest level in nearly two years, but the economy generated only 36,000 net new jobs, that's net is important, the, fast, the fewest, excuse me, in four months. The January report illustrates how job growth remains the economy's weakest spot even as other economic indicators point to a recovery that is strengthening. Friday's report offered a conflicting picture on hiring. Unemployment fell because the Labor Department's household survey determined that more than a half million people without jobs found work. The department conducts a separate survey of businesses which showed tepid job creation. The two surveys sometimes diverge. Severe winter weather likely reduced the number of jobs created. Harsh snowstorms storms last month cut into the construction employment, which fell by 32,000, the most since May. Transportation and warehousing also fell by 38,000, the most in a year. In one bright spot, manufacturing added 49,000 jobs, the most since August 1998. Uh, but part of that drop has occurred when many of those out of work gave up their job searches. When unemployed people stopped looking for work, the government no longer counts them. The number of people unemployed fell by more than 600,000 in January to 13.9 million. That's still about double the total that were out of work when the recession began in December 2007. Okay, so what's that all mean to you? <laughs> um, first of all, there are two separate surveys, and the, number, the two main numbers come from different surveys. Uh, so one is a survey of employers, and that's the 36,000 number, and normally we consider that the stronger number for the total because it's kind of like an administrative survey and employers obviously um, know how many are on their payroll. Uh, the unemployment number comes from a survey of people, a monthly thing called the, CERT, the, um, pop, uh, the census uh, population survey. Um, and that's only about 180,000 people. So that gives us, we ask individuals, are, are they looking? And we do a lot of follow-up questions on that. Uh, so basically what you have is one survey, the employment survey saying 36, and another survey saying 500,000. These are monthly variations, and we shouldn't you know, be too concerned about, uh, about uh, necessarily the low numbers, and we should be looking at the multi- still low unemployment gains. Let's just underscore that. that if, if we don't start creating over 100, over 200, even over 300,000 jobs a month, the unemployment rate's going to be high for a long time. So that's the question we're going to try, that I'll be addressing during the course of today's discussion. Is it possible that by April we could be seeing 300,000 or more a month? And, uh, but it, the, so this is, a, I would argue, a, uh, lukewarm, we don't know, we'll see what happens next month. The unemployment rate going to 9% is uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, I wouldn't expect the unemployment rate to fall. I wouldn't be surprised to see it rise in the next couple of months. I mean, I think that, again, uh, these are statistical issues, <laughs> and these are not precise numbers. Even the employer survey, who we survey changes because there are small companies that are forming and, and falling apart. So. None of the numbers are rock solid. So 
So if you had to put yourself on a, a, a where, where's your fulcrum about where the economy is right now? It, what we know is that um,